It's, it's quite a journey you've taken to get to this point. Let's go back. Uh, give me a sense of what your life was like before your injury. Well, I was living the dream in Whistler, as many 28-year-olds would. Um, generally, I had set up my life so that I could free ride snowboard every day and uh, work hard for seven or eight months of the year. I, I'm an environmental planner, so I design and install landscapes uh, for a living. I have about 13 employees who allow me to sort of do the sports also. So Was snowboarding something you would actually consider doing competitively? No, I played rugby and uh, football all my life. Um, I always thought snowboarding was a bit, you know, the tights and everything at that time in the early 90s. It was kind of like, well, but I snowboarded with the guys that raced and they were supreme snowboarders. Don't, nothing to take that away. But I was a free, free rider, like big mountain. So, so take, a, take us back to this fateful day. Your accident, December 30th, uh, 2000, I guess almost exactly uh, coming up on the, the 13th anniversary. Set the scene for us. What was going on that day? Well, I was out with uh, three other good friends. Uh, we had just gotten off the lift and around 2.30, it would be the regular practice of ours to go on a hike. Uh, when you get really proficient at these sports, being gravity sports, I mean, you're in the mountains, so you kind of want to earn your turns sometimes. So it it was around 2.30 and we had met up. We're Two of us were on skis, two of us were on snowboards. Um, a couple of guys I grew up with in Halifax, Chris was in for from New York where he lives now, and uh, the other fellas on skis are lawyers down in Vancouver that I grew up with. And, and what happened? Tell us about the crash if you can. Well, we were going to go bounce and on the Blackcomb Glacier, it's, it's a big sort of 30 degree pitch, uh, down and then there's other glaciers going up and it's surrounded in a bunch of mountains. So generally skiers would get up into the glacier, you walk in and you ski across on like a 45 degree angle to the gate to go to bounds into Garibaldi Provincial Park. Uh, predominantly snowboarders like myself would hike across what is known the wind lip, uh, across the top of the glacier and then we'd take a high traverse line to the upper gate to get out of bounds under a run called Ladies First. And about at that point at Ladies First, I looked and we were a bit further ahead than the skiers. And so there was a great fall line um, to the other gate. So I pointed to that gate. And before the gate, about 40 meters before the gate, uh, there was a big snow drift. And I was like, oh, I'm going to hit that snow drift. I can see the other side. I presumed, which nobody ever should do, um, that it was a two to four foot drop onto a flat. Mm. And... Um, you know, I, I'd just be on the other side. I didn't think anything of it. And as I was in the air, I looked down and it's a 30 foot hole in the ground and a buttress where two glaciers meet. And, you know, the rest is history. The back of my board hit the knuckle of the cliff that sort of creates the buttress and flipped me upside down. And luckily in 2000, I was wearing a helmet and it saved my life because for sure my neck would have snapped. Um, but because I played rugby and football for years, I had the strength and the and I guess the muscle build so that the weight met in the middle for my snowboard coming down and that's when my back exploded. So it's the lesser of all evils. A lot of people would have died. So instantly I was paralyzed from the waist down. And after your examinations, what kinds of things were your doctors telling you? Well, according to the X-ray, it looked like the bone went right through the uh, through the spinal cord, which is the consistency of about toothpaste. So it looked like a complete injury. Um, but, uh, they were saying you'd never walk again. No, for never. sure. For I, sure. I, 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 it's, it's so remarkable your story because in, in the interviews I've read, at least you can corroborate this, but it never seems like you were resigned to, to your fate after your, your injury, you almost immediately begin your quest to get back on your feet. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to ignore a serious prognosis from the doctors. Where did that positivity and strength come from within you? Well, a big part of it is, um, you know, not accepting what you're given. And I knew a bit about spinal cord injury and I was in real denial at first, I think. And so with my tenacity and perseverance, I'd had several injuries in sports and rugby and football that I knew that they could heal, but I was in denial about what a spinal cord injury was. It wasn't until um, something came back that I realized that if one part came back, that perhaps more would come back and there'd be a connectivity created somehow. And obviously I did not have a complete injury. So all of a sudden I was truly inspired 
to 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 walk again. I mean, as unlikely as it was, and continued to be told that it would be unlikely, I persisted. I mean, seeing you walk in here today, I wouldn't guess that. Uh, apparently, you're you're forty forty percent paralyzed below the waist. Yeah, I mean, I mean you, 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 uh, what, what kind of restrictions do you face now? Well, mainly the backs of my legs are paralyzed, so I walk around like you see people in a parade on the drywalling stilts. I walk on my heels. I I I load that, and I'm very particular at trying to have my gait not with uh, a limp. Um, after riding a snowboard all day, you know, I look like I'm limping or if I'm tired or I've done something. But predominantly the muscles that I do have, the 60% that I do have, work really well and I've learned to adapt very well and use muscles to perform, you know, greater functionality. Well, it took you two years to learn to walk again. That, that's one step. Uh, doing anything more physical is another big challenge. Uh, and even a somewhat benign sport like cross-country skiing has risks for a guy with a serious back injury. What led you to that sport? Well, um, depression. Um, I couldn't walk my dog. I moved back to Whistler and it snows every day in the winter. And I couldn't move around. I couldn't walk my dog. So I wanted to get out. So I had to, I said, I either have to start doing something in the winter or I have to leave Whistler. And so I asked a friend to help me and we got some skis and we, I just learned to shuffle, which, cause I walk on my heels. If you try to walk on your heels and say the beach or whatever, it's very difficult. Um, so it took me a while to shuffle. And then once I learned to shuffle, you know, a couple hundred meters, then, you know, I wanted to learn how to ski, but you can't really ski normally. So I sought help and um, I got a bit of lesson. And then I met Brian McKeever and the national team coach, Casper Wears. And I asked, you know, I'm a goal setter. I'm, a, I'm someone that achieves Clearly. goals. Yeah. So I said, you know, hey, you know, what would it take to be on the national team? And they just looked at me and and I, I was a bit chubby at the time. And... Uh, because I wasn't doing much and being paralyzed. And they said, well, young man, just go ski 850 kilometers and then we'll talk to you on the phone. And so and that's you did what it. I did. That's and you end up at the Olympics in Vancouver. But for cross-country skiing, it, it's somewhat surprising that para snowboarding is only making its Paralympic deb debut now. Why has it taken so long and why is it so important for you to make sure para snowboarding was included in the Paralympics? Well, first off, snowboarding's a new sport, relatively speaking. We have a new event in snowboarding and slope style in the Olympics this year, relatively speaking. Um, for me, what I noticed is people living with a disability, when they went to the mountains, were told that they had to ski. And if they wanted to snowboard, they were told, well, we know how to teach you how to ski. And uh, I thought to myself, gee, you know, this, I'm looking life through this new lens. You know, if I were a 15 year old and this happened to me and I were in the same situation, you know, all my friends are going snowboarding. I would want to go snowboarding. So how can I turn this bad thing that's happened to me into a good thing? And I went to the local adaptive program and said, hey, you guys should offer this. And they said, sure. And they were going through some changes. Can you be on our board of directors? I said, sure. And then um, the year previous, I went to the Canadian Sports Federation, uh, Canadian Snowboard Federation, sorry, and I did a presentation at their AGM saying, you know, snowboarding for the disabled should be part of your mandate. And they made a motion that day and it passed unanimously and the rest is, is history. You're going to Sochi as a, as a para snowboarder. That's right. Uh, and you're going for gold. I, if, if you don't mind me outing you as, as someone who's you're around my age, I mean, many athletes at the Olympics and Paralympics are quite young. I mean, you're by no means age, ancient, but you're, you're in your 40s now, right? You're early 40s. What, talk to me about the kind of training challenges you're facing as a more mature athlete. Well, yeah, um, I often get asked if I'm the coach. Right? <laughs> and then I have to answer no three times. And then I was inspiring because someone wanted to, to be a snowboarder when they were my age, when I was at a race. I said, don't you mean because I'm disabled? And they said, you're what? I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit more difficult. I mean, obviously there's only so many athletes living with a disability that are true athletes. Um, this is something that I was extremely good at before I had my spinal cord injury. Right. And it's something that I've worked very hard at now. I mean, You're yeah, saying that 40 somethings can't just pick this up and get to the Olympics? No. And with my disability, I mean, I don't think if you didn't snowboard beforehand, you probably couldn't right. snowboard at the level that we're snowboarding at, but you don't recover as quickly. Um, you know, you, it's, it's a, it's an amateur sport. I mean, we all have jobs. Uh, obviously people would expect you to 
perform at a level that it's a professional or full-time sport. But, uh, yeah, it's not easy, Jean. It's, um, it's quite painful. You're an incredibly driven guy. And, and para snowboarding is now an Olympic sport. It's amazing what you've accomplished as an athlete. Is, is Sochi it for you? What, what, what do you see yourself doing looking ahead in terms of as an athlete? Well, of course, you always want to be a leader if you're put into that uh, position, right? And if I can continue to advocate for people living with a disability, participating in sports and healthy living, I would like to do that and continue on being an inspire inspiration and being inspired by others, of course. But I, I, as a goal setter, I know that in 2015, I'm going to do um, this Arctic Circle race in Greenland, and that'll be my next training goal for cross-country skiing. So that's three cross-country Loppet marathons in three days. You do a big loop in Greenland in April. So I've got all these sort of life goals that I want to accomplish right. physically. You're taking so. it easy after Sochi, apparently. Well, otherwise you just... <laughs> get fat <laughs> you know that i've got that gene right so if i don't go up the stairs and you know it's 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 a lot harder when you get older so if you set these goals you, you try to achieve them hey man congratulations it'll be fun to see you see you at, at sochi and and uh, uh i'm inspired and 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 proud of what you've done for for sport and for canada thank you for this